and take it away, Lewis. Thank you. Cool. Well, thank you, David. Um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, you've made me feel right at home um, here. Yeah, you know, the commute was uh, relaxing. Uh, the hotel has been like the bed has been um, as comfortable as sleeping in my own bed. Um, so this has been you know, a delightful experience. I'm great. It's, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, so I uh, don't really know what this uh, what this talk is. Um, to be honest, uh, as, uh, you know, like you. Um, uh, my world got uh, turned a little bit upside down uh, a couple of months ago um, by COVID-19 uh, and um, uh, possibly like, uh, like some of you, I started thinking about it, you know, as somebody who um, claims to uh, be interested in studying you know, complex human sy systems, studying social systems uh, and things like this, it, it seemed um, uh, very sensible to, uh, use, uh, to use the time that I had to start um, to try and look at uh, COVID-19 and try to look at um, coronavirus and um, uh, do some modeling and some data science uh, around it. Um, and one of the things uh, that was nice as a person uh, who likes to study social media is that all these um, social media companies, um, you know, uh, uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, and you will have seen um, uh, Google and Apple uh, started uh, providing bits of data um, to scientists uh, to, for, for analysis. So there was an opportunity to actually um, to do some science using social media data, um, which is a rare thing. You know, these, these companies don't often give up um, data to researchers very easily. Um, so it seemed perfectly sensible to start um, uh, trying to look at these things as I started to do that. Um, and so this talk is, uh, is the result of the, the stuff that I've been uh, looking at and the, you know, the various groups that I've um, been involved at, uh, uh, the sorts of things that we've been looking at um, you know, particularly to do with social media data, just because that's my that's become my thing uh, over the past few years a little bit. Um, uh, so it's very much uh, work in progress uh, sort of stuff. It's at a far um, uh, a, a far more preliminary level uh, than uh, the sort of talk that I'd usually give. Um, but you know, it's the last day of semester. I just gave my last lecture, so hopefully this is sort of interesting. You know, a bit more uh, of a relaxed sort of talk. I'm trying. Uh, uh, treated a little bit more um, uh, casually than I usually would. Um, than I usually would with one of these things. So I actually have um, uh, not one talk, but sort of like three mini talks um, to give here, um, a varying degrees of, um, uh, of preparedness uh, about three different topics. So you know, three of the um, uh, the things that have come up for me, um, you know, during this pandemic has been, you know, one has been um, contact tracing. Um, so I got um, uh, involved with some um, some work around contact tracing, um, and there's a bit of mathematical modelling there. Um, uh, uh, we started to to look at, you know, how effective we might expect a um, a, a digital contact tracing uh, app to be. So I started trying to predict um, or think about what level of the pop what proportion of the population. Uh, would need to uh, adopt uh, any sort of contact tracing app if the government were going to introduce uh, such an app um, uh, in order for it to be effective. So um, there's some modelling around that. Uh, and then an app did indeed appear, uh, the COVID Safe uh, app appeared. Um, you know, we were uh, uh, working on it. Uh, and so I started to um, you know, uh, try and track the response to that app uh, on Twitter. And so I've got a few uh, results to show. Um, there about that. And then the second, you know, the um, possibly the most significant thing that we've been working on uh, over the past uh, month or two, and this is in collaboration with um, uh, other researchers from Melbourne Uni and from uh, UNSW, uh, is quantifying social distancing. So um, one of the companies that never ever gives out data um, is Facebook, uh, and they actually made uh, some data available, um, you know, location, uh, aggregated location data about um, uh, from users of, of the Facebook app. Um, which you can use to measure how people are, uh, are moving around and whether they're staying uh, put, um, whether they're social distancing, uh, whether they're going out, who they're, um, you know, uh, what places they're interacting in and things like this. And so we've um, uh, been using that to try and uh, look at the number of contacts that people might make uh, and potentially doing some risk mapping as well. If there's an outbreak um, in some region um, and you know that people are moving between you know, where people are, uh, are moving uh, between at some aggregated level, what's the, uh, the risk of there being um, of that uh, outbreak spreading uh, uh, throughout, the, throughout the area? 
Uh, and then the last one um, is a bit uh, opportunistic. So there's a, a PhD student who's working on uh, natural language processing uh, and extracting um, you know, uh, uh, patient experiences uh, from, uh, from data that's shared online. Um, and so with him, we've been looking at um, trying to measure the arc of patient experience uh, for patients who have tested uh, positive to coronavirus because you know, there's a particular Reddit um, uh, uh, forum where people can uh, can share their experiences there and so we've been doing some sentiment analysis and some topic modeling on that and we'll talk about that um, at the end so okay so let's get started so you know um, uh, starting off with the contact tracing uh, work which is a, the thing I started working on first um, uh, this is uh, uh, mainly in collaboration with this guy uh, Peter Eckersley, uh, who's a, um, a computer scientist, uh, a hacker who um, uh, works with the uh, Electronic Frontiers Foundation uh, uh, in the in the US as a position at, at Stanford, um, and you know as uh, as a really interesting uh, really interesting guy, um, and uh, with James McCaw, you know media personality, um, star of TV uh, and radio and, and print, uh, uh, James McCaw from the University of Melbourne. Um, uh, the two of these guys uh, authored a, 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 an article called Tech Companies um, at this website, stopcovid.tech, um, you know, calling on tech companies to um, uh, uh, try and uh, release various strategies to, to try and mitigate, um, try and attack coronavirus. Um, and so that's at this website, stopcovid.tech, which is very interesting. So, you know, interestingly, Peter got um, stranded in Australia. He was um, visiting um, Australia and then got stranded when the pandemic hit. Uh, and so um, uh, th through James McCaw, um, uh, we ended up uh, connecting and talking about, um, uh, talking about contact tracing, um, potential contact tracing apps and trying to model uh, the effectiveness. So it was an interesting, um, you know, interesting, uh, a random connection uh, that got made there. So, um, some of the questions that, uh, so we started looking at this back in uh, February or so, I think, uh, late February, early March. And, you know, the first question that we had um, about uh, digital contact tracing, so contact tracing apps, is do we even need it um, in Australia? And this is not, to me, this is uh, not at all clear, right? Um, you, you, you know, um, obviously at the moment, Australia's got really low levels um, uh, of coronavirus, so there's not an, uh, even a, an awful lot of human manual contact tracing um, happening. Certainly, uh, uh, no great need for um, for the app uh, uh, to be used. And you know, if you think about it, um, uh, the fact that Australia has acted um, early and has got coronavirus um, uh, reasonably under control means it's very possible that uh, manual co contact tracing might be scalable. Um, in Australia. So if you wanted to throw money at a problem of, of, of contact tracing, a pretty good way to do it in Australia would be to just hire more um, contact tracers, um, hire more human contact tracers, particularly when unemployment is, um, uh, is so high. Um, uh, so, you, you know, it's, it's, it's not immediately clear that we uh, need to do, uh, have a coronavirus uh, contact tracing app at all. Um, but if we're going to go down this route, um, uh, then there's a couple of things that digital contract tracing should be able to uh, should be able to do. There are still a couple of benefits um, to digital contact uh, to digital contact tracing, um, and so the, those are these. Um, so uh, digital contract sh tracing should be able to be faster uh, than manual contact tracing. That's one of the, the claims that often gets uh, made about it. So. Um, uh, uh, you know, it takes some number of days for a, once you've been uh, diagnosed with coronavirus, for a contact tracer to call you up and uh, to conduct an interview with you, uh, go through the process of uh, locating all of your contacts um, and then uh, put it into a database. Uh, and your contact tracers uh, still use paper uh, and stuff for this uh, a lot of the time and type things into uh, by hand into databases and then to go and contact all those contacts, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that process takes, you know, some days. Um, so uh, digital contact tracing and the COVID safe app, et cetera, has the potential to be a lot faster. Um, uh, it would be even faster if we were using a more decentralized uh, approach. Um, and then the really important thing um, is that uh, the, the unique thing about contact tracing apps is that they have the potential um, to find more contacts uh, that you, uh, than you might be able to use in manual contact tracing. So you know, um, through manual contact tracing, you can only remember the people that you know 
Um, so uh, contacting the person that you sat next to on the bus or something like this is going to be uh, difficult um, unless anybody, uh, unless you have uh, you know, you have uh, people with phones installed that are communicating. So yeah, you know, so that's um, do we even need the contact tracing? Uh, not necessarily, but there are some benefits. Um, some of the other questions that we have is, you know, over the past, uh, since March, you know, uh, there are a few weeks there where there seem to be you know, uh, just as an exponential growth in the number of coronavirus cases and, ex and not an exponential growth in the number of proposals for contact tracing apps um, that were coming out, particularly, um, you know, a range of different protocols um, that can be used for this and different levels of uh, privacy associated, associated with each one. And the question a couple of months ago, you know, back towards the start of the semester, was which one of these should Australia adopt? Um, and, you know, we've gone down a particular route, um, but there's, uh, there, there are choices to be made there. Um, and then the, the, uh, the big question with any contact tracing app uh, is how effective uh, would it be? And you know, in particular, how many people in the population uh, need to uh, adopt any app if you're going to introduce it uh, in order for it to be um, in order for it to be effective. Now, this is really difficult to um, uh, to quantify. There are many, many uh, unknowns here. Um, so this is where we thought, you know, this is where perhaps a model can um, a simulation model can provide some insight or start us to give us a more um, quantitative framework in which to start asking these questions. So that, dis you know, those, that discussion of all of those issues, you know, that sort of motivates um, uh, a little bit about the actual model that we, uh, that we wrote down uh, and that we started to, started to use. So here's a, um, uh, actually a relatively simple, uh, fairly simple um, contact, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, disease model. Um, this is similar in broad structure to the ones uh, used by um, you know, the Doherty Institute group. So you know, uh, James McCaw and uh, Jody McCartney's group um, that have been uh, that have been doing the uh, uh, simulations and uh, scenario modeling for the, for the government. This is like um, this is like what they use. So it's a basic, you know, an SEIR type model. Uh, if you know these things, um, uh, and uh, like them, we have a quarantined uh, compartment. So, um, with some probability, um, one uh, with some probability one minus p, um, you migrate along the um, you know susceptible to exposed to infected to recovered path. Um, these are normal uh, dynamics, um, but with probability p, uh, you get contact traced. Right, you get identified uh, before you uh, get exposed. Um, uh, well, uh, yeah, before you. Um, uh, start showing uh, symptoms, I suppose, uh, and, uh, uh, and start infecting other people. And then you can get put into quarantine. So you can get told to self-isolate uh, or something like this. Uh, so that's uh, uh, relatively, that's pretty straight, uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, we have uh, this uh, part down the bottom here, the L dot, um, is a lockdown um, um, factor that we add into the model, so a social distancing. Um, so we basically um, incorporate social distancing in this model uh, by saying that you know, if the incidence uh, goes above some certain threshold, right, if cases are taken off too quickly, um, then we reduce, uh, uh, we reduce R0 essentially, uh, R0 effective to below one, um, and people stay home. Um, and so there's just uh, less all round transmission. Um, and so we have that, you'll see this in the model in a couple of steps. So that's, a relatively simple uh, epidemiological model. Oh, there should be a, uh, there should be a p there. In my s dot. Um, nice little typo. Uh, oh no, no, there shouldn't. Sorry, that's right. Um, there's the p in the one minus p. Um, that's relatively simple. But you know, the big question is, what's this number p? Right? What's this proportion of people who get um, quarantined? Uh, and how does that relate to uh, contact tracing? And so that's where you know the thing becomes actually quite. Um, complex uh, and I'm still hiding away a lot of the, um, uh, the complexity here. So essentially um, uh, we sort of decompose that probability p uh, into a few different factors, um, each of which we try to uh, model or parameterize uh, as best we can. Um, so the first is that you know if you introduce this app uh, and that app is going to lead to you quarantining more people, um, we're going to say you do that at a certain date, you know, right? So the app launches at a certain date uh, T launch uh, and um, uh, 
uh, uh, yeah, and then it, it launches with some adoption rate, um, you know, a fraction of the population that's uh, installed the app. So you can only be contact traced if you've installed the app, right? And that's the, um, uh, that's the major parameter here. Uh, then there's this factor uh, uh, F race. So, and we've thought about this as the, um, the probability of, uh, of winning the contact race, the tracing race, right? So once um, uh, a contact is, uh, is infected, is, is contacted by an infected person, um, then there's a certain amount of time, you know, the generation time, uh, the time for um, uh, them to uh, go on and infect somebody else, uh, in which you have to sort of catch that person um, you know, via the original person, uh, uh, get diagnosed, uh, then uh, getting contact traced, um, and you're know, identifying that contact and then telling them to get into isolation. So you essentially have a, a probability uh, of the time it takes to do the contact tracing, that's the tau r there essentially, um, uh, being less than the generation time, the time for this newly infected person to infect somebody else. Um, so that's actually, you know, I'm hiding a lot of uh, parameters uh, in a distribution um, of generation times uh, and things in that. and that. Um, uh, but you know, it's essentially trying to capture that idea. And then you have um, the probability of people actually being tested uh, as well. So you only have a certain rate of testing uh, in the population. You, know, you can assume that's constant or going up. Um, you know, in the US, it's been varying uh, quite a bit. Um, in Australia, it's been a bit more uh, constant uh, throughout time. Um, but yeah, you can, only, uh, you can only detect a certain number um, uh, of infections because you only have a certain pool of uh, all the tests which you might uh, which you might hear so that's the, the broad structure and you know there's um the truth is there's lots of there are lots and lots of parameters in there uh, many of which we tried to uh, estimate from the literature which was coming out at the time um, and we put distributions uh, on a bunch of uh, parameters including the you know r naught and the um uh, various epidemiological parameters and then essentially what we did with this is we ran a lot of simulations so now we um, decided to um, let's just go uh, uh, Monte Carlo, um, do lots of draws of uh, lots of these parameters, uh, and then look at the universe of things that can happen. I can start to explore a few things. Um, so here's the number of uh, uh, the proportion uh, of people who get quarantined um, as a function in the colours uh, of the um, of the app launch date. So if you launch the app later and later and later. Um, as the colors go from blue to yellow, uh, you quarantine less and less people, right? So um, uh, this has got some strange curves, uh, kinks in it because we have this um, lockdown um, aspect going on in the background here. Um, so when the incidence gets above a certain rate, you lock down. And so then the growth uh, of, the, uh, of the epidemic curve slows down. Uh, yeah, so you, you can start to explore that and you can start to explore lots of things. So really what we did is we just started randomly sampling uh, the, all of the various parameters uh, that we had. So we put a distribution uh, on the app launch date, uh, for example. Um, so here's five, five draws um, uh, of those parameter sets and some simulations completely randomly. And um, the crosses here show you when we're simulating the app being launched. So you can see that there's some variation in those. So after you know, three months or so since the um, outbreak started, um, uh, we, launched the, uh, we launched the app to try and um, calibrate to um, when we launched this app in Australia. Um, and uh, then you see these curves start to diverge and the dashed curve shows uh, the, the number of exposed, uh, you know, which is the same as the number of um, uh, infected people uh, as, um, uh, as time goes on, um, so in the dash, it's where we have the app, we've turned this app on, uh, and in the black, it's where we uh, haven't turned uh, our hypothetical uh, app on. So all of these different apps have different uh, adoption rates in the population. Uh, we have yeah, various different parameters. And the sawtooth thing here that you see, uh, that's because we have this, uh, we've built in this lockdown uh, idea. So um, once the incidence goes above a certain, uh, a certain rate, a certain threshold, uh, then we lock down, uh, effectively uh, reduce, uh, reduce our effective um, uh, to below one. Um, and so uh, you know, the um, uh, incidence uh, drops down again. Uh, and then after, I think we set it to be 30 days or something like this, uh, and, uh, and then you open up and the epidemic takes off again. Um, so we have this you know, switch that comes on and off. And so that means that you get this 
um, sawtooth, um, which is not necessarily realistic, um, but uh, you know, we're trying to capture some form of social distancing. And so you can see uh, already that um, there's some difference right uh, here in terms of the uh, in terms of the app. Uh, yeah, so you get this sawtooth as, you know, people call this the hammer and the dance, right? The hammer is locking down uh, and then you take the foot off the brake and you watch this thing go up. Let's see, so here's the uh, quarantine population. Um, so you can see that we're quarantining uh, more people. So in the dashed lines in each of these simulations where you have the, uh, the app come in, uh, you are starting to quarantine more people, uh, which is as you would expect. Um, and we can look at things like uh, the number of days spent in lockdown uh, as well, which I think this is, uh, is this. So here, um, I guess the y-axis doesn't make, um, uh, it's not meaningful here, it's, it's a, a proportion uh, from some number that doesn't, uh, that's not really important. Um, uh, but you can look at the, the cumulative number of days of lockdown uh, in these worlds where you have this app. Um, compared to not having the app. And so the general trend that you see in most of these curves uh, is that you have, you're going to have less days of lockdown uh, in these worlds with the app. Um, and so that's the general feature. So one important thing, um, yeah, I mean, that's the, uh, that's the thing that we really want to look at, right? So here is, um, you know, this is the key uh, figure in the, all of this modeling, um, which is that as a function of the proportion of the population that's using the app along the x-axis, so where we just uh, are simulating a whole bunch of different uh, worlds, so each dot is a different choice of parameters, uh, there's a different universe essentially, uh, and then we look at the, uh, the number of days of lockdown um, that you get, the number of days you get spent in this uh, are affected less than one um, state uh, for the um, uh, yeah, for the, um, uh, the simulations where you have this Bluetooth app. And so, you know, the higher the proportion uh, of the population using the app, the less days of lockdown that you have. So that makes sense uh, and it gets quite dramatic uh, for uh, proportions close to one. But probably the most important curve uh, here is this curve on the right, um, which shows you the distribution of, of, of days saved. So if you have a, a look at the universe uh, where you don't have the app, compare that with everything else the same, um, uh, but you have this app and you turn it on at some launch date, um, what's, the, what's the number of days of lockdown that you save through that additional contact tracing? Um, and you can see that um, you get this sort of quadratic uh, effect, right? And that's a consequence of the fact that to be able to contact trace um, using an app, both parties uh, have to have installed the app, right? So this sort of takes off in this, quad you know, this quadratic effect because um, you need both people to have the app. Um, and the important thing here is that, you know, every dot is a different uh, set of parameters um, and there's a huge amount of uh, variation uh, amongst all of those parameters. But, you know, what you see is that unless you have, starting to have um, uh, app adoption rates that are, you know, well above a half, right, getting up, uh, close to you know, close to one, you know, it's a long way before you start seeing really big um, decreases, uh, you know, numbers of days of lockdown um, saved. I should also mention that um, the reduction in mortality, you know, you can go through and model, um, say 1% of um, people who contract the disease die, and you can look at the reduction uh, in mortality um, from this contact tracing app, and that's really, really small. Now, no matter what um, uh, proportion of the population is using the app, uh, at all, so um, you know that's just um, that's just the way it is. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, here's where we to to put um, some actual numbers on this. Um, uh, you know, here's where we are currently. About uh, twenty four percent or so of the population has uh, installed this app. I looked up COVID nineteen data dot com last night. Um, found there's about six million downloads, and so that means we're at um, you know we're around about four days. You know, maybe uh, maybe ten at the outside um, in the most uh, advantageous uh, scenario. Uh, looking at this you know, simplistic model, so at the current level of people who've downloaded this app, um, that's how many uh, days of lockdown have been saved. If we hit the prime minister's target, which you might remember uh, back when the app was announced, he was hoping that forty percent of people. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, download the app. We're a long way from that. Uh, if we get there, um, then you know there's some there's a fair bit of variation, but it's of the order of like ten days, two weeks of lockdown um, that we would have saved 
um, in this world. So, you know, it, it, that's not a lot, right? Um, but uh, of course, you know, um, the government does have these estimates that every week of lockdown costs $10 billion or whatever, um, uh, whatever it is. So that's you know, a non-trivial, uh, very non-trivial amount. Um, I'd be happy to take a 0.0001% commission uh, for the modeling that we did on that savings. Um, uh, if that you know, uh, if that were to come off, um, but you know the the take home message is uh, uh, is about this curve. Like you really need uh, quite high levels um, of adoption. So this was largely work that we did, um, you know, um, in early March uh, or so, um, before um, well there was still discussion of a contact tracing app, but nothing uh, had come out yet. Uh, and then of course this came along, um, you know, in uh, whenever it was mid to um, uh, April or so, it's been around for a, a month or two. Um, and then we had some more questions, right? So the first was, you know, is this uh, COVID safe uses the, um, uh, the Bluetooth, Bluetooth, Blue Trace protocol that um, was used in Singapore? Um, and, you know, can I ask, is that the best approach um, uh, to a contact tracing app? Is that the most sensible protocol? Probably not. Um, uh, you know, particularly, um, you know, in some separate modeling, we looked at uh, the effect of a, a, a Google and Apple type um, API approach where you might be able to go back and, and use some location history from back in the past, um, do some retrospective um, location matching, um, and that, as you would expect, is more, um, is more effective. Um, yeah, and, you know, how many people need to download it, uh, need, need to download the app? Well, I mean, that is how long is a piece of string, right? Like if, um, uh, you know, uh, there's some, there's some non-zero uh, improvement, uh, uh, decrease in the number of days of lockdown that you have here, as soon as, you know, two people have installed, installed the app, there's some probability of uh, contact being traced and saving some lockdown. Um, but, you know, it's, um, uh, it's a bit of a how long is a piece of string question. Uh, and the most important question is, you know, will the Australian public trust this app, right? Like the, the thing that's clear from that main figure is that you need to have lots of people downloading these apps uh, in order for them to be effective. And there is where I think um, first impressions matter. Um, so this is where I, um, as soon as the app was launched or a few hours before the app was launched, I heard it was going to be called COVID safe and, um, and immediately um, uh, uh, coded up my Twitter API, um, you know, scraping code to go and grab every um, tweet containing the phrase COVID safe. Um, and so these lines here actually show you, um, you know, this was when the app was launched at three o'clock and this is 6 p.m. Uh, when it was announced on, on the news. So this is, you know, a day or two after, um, uh, after the app was launched. So, you know, um, uh, uh, this number of tweets uh, from the uh, Twitter public API um, in the first couple of days is quite a lot um, uh, for Australia. Uh, and the interesting thing that you saw is that if you looked at the reach uh, of the people who were tweeting about the app uh, very early on, um, it was sort of like influencers, right? People with large follower um, numbers uh, were tweeting about uh, the app early on. So those early adopters were, you know, what you would call social media influencers, you know, heavily inverted comments there. And so then the question becomes, you know, what are they tweeting about uh, uh, very early on here? What's the impression, the public uh, uh, sentiment around the app? Um, and so you can do some sentiment uh, analysis. Um, so, you know, I'm calculating, I'm using a, um, a sentiment analysis dictionary uh, that I've known and loved from since my University of Vermont days um, called the Hedonometer. I don't need to say too much about it. Um, it's a very naive sort of dictionary-based approach to sentiment analysis. But basically, low is bad. Um, you know, uh, higher is, uh, is happier. So you see that very early on, you know, those influencers are tweeting negative stuff uh, about the app. Uh, and then it sort of uh, improves uh, as people start to download the app. Um, yeah, you know, this is the middle of the night. Uh, and so there's a small number of users here who are tweeting very negative stuff. That feels a bit bot-like um, to me, um, but I haven't gone and investigated it yet. And over a longer period of time, you saw, you know, there was this initial um, backlash uh, from the um, uh, from the early adopters of the app were very negative about it. It's gone up and down since then, um, you know. And after a couple of couple of weeks, it's starting to decay. And so, you know, as you probably know from watching the media, um, you know, the public sentiment has not been uh, it's not been too flash uh, to uh, to COVID safe. And if I were the government, you know, I would care about this. So, quick summary on that part, um, uh, just to say. 
Um, you know, we're yet to see the um, potential benefits of um, the digital contact tracing app. We don't have an, an awful lot of um, contacts to be traced at the moment, certainly not in South Australia. Um, uh, so this is, you know, it's still up in the air whether this is useful uh, or not. Um, I think the modeling results show some stuff that's fairly obvious, which is that uh, any level of adoption has some non-zero chance of being beneficial. Um, but really to see large effects, to see large improvements, um, you really need to have very, very high adoption rates, which raises um, questions about how you're going to, um, how you're going to get there, how you're going to convince Australians to do that. Um, COVID safe is almost certainly uh, not the best approach, either from a practical um, standpoint or even from a, um, probably from a privacy um, standpoint, you know, it's not a, a fully decentralized um, uh, approach and there are uh, ways that you can do it better. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been interesting uh, in all of this to, uh, that it's become sort of totemic for, emblematic for um, privacy concerns that I think stretch beyond just um, coronavirus. So yeah, it's an, uh, it's an interesting case study. And um, yeah, I mean, we've got some uh, funding from the cybersecurity uh, CRC to keep exploring this sentiment and um, this social media response and this sentiment analysis stuff around the app. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to now the semester's over to getting into that. So, now, um, if people have questions, then please pop them into the chat. Um, I'm keeping, uh, I'm watching it um, and I'll come back. But otherwise, I'll press on. You know, I probably won't talk about the third part here in any great detail at all. I'll just point you to the, um, uh, point you to the, um, uh, to the website perhaps. But I do want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about this one, this social distancing one, um, where this is uh, using some data from, from Facebook. So um, here we've been trying to, um, been trying to quantify uh, social distancing, as you would have seen um, uh, people are doing with lots of, you know, looking at reductions in mobility uh, uh, using Google data, uh, Apple, um, uh, uh, Apple data, um, uh, etc. And Paul's, uh, okay, I've got a question. Paul, you said this privately, but um, uh, uh, I'll assume that this is a, a question for, uh, for everybody, but it's about the, about the talk. Um, yeah, I said the Bluetooth uh, aspect of COVID safe uh, was not the best. Uh, I didn't really say, um, didn't really say why. I actually think that the Bluetooth um, aspect of contact tracing um, is uh, pretty, privacy preserving, or if you're going to go down this route, um, uh, uh, um, storing uh, Bluetooth contacts is about as privacy preserving as you can be. Um, you know, there are ways to do these contact tracing apps. Uh, I think that have a centralized uh, approach where you can sort of um, uh, flag contacts and uh, request them to go and get a, um, uh, request them to go and get a test. Um, and that's, I think, going to be more privacy preserving than having any, having any sort of central um, repository of, um, of information or contacts. That said, you know, the way the Australian government is, um, is doing it seems to be, um, you know, uh, uh, relatively, um, uh, relatively okay there. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, there are lots of questions. You know, if we we're going to go to the pub after this talk, um, it would be a perfect time to talk about that stuff. Um, let me press on to uh, quantifying um, uh, social distancing. So this is in collaboration uh, with some people from uh, the University of Melbourne. So Cameron Zacherson is a new um, postdoc there, and Nick Geard uh, is in the computer science department at the University of Melbourne. And my colleague Josh Ross uh, has been helping with some of the maths here as well. So here's um, uh, here's my plot uh, of um, of waning uh, of social distancing in Australia. Uh, in all of the states uh, over the past, you know, since February. And um, so you can see the red lines there are when um, the Prime Minister made various announcements um, of varying, going to stage, sort of, you know, stage one, two, three, sort of levels of social distancing um, and of staying at home. Uh, and then, you know, in the past couple of weeks, we've had a couple of um, reopening, um, reopenings. Um, and I'm measuring some, it's a, some measure of the average number of contacts that people make uh, in each of these states. So, you know, there's an interesting, um, interesting trends here straight away, which is that um, social distancing is waning you know, in most states. That's one of the things that you, uh, that you notice, but not nearly as much um, based on this data uh, as I might have uh, expected from, you know, uh, from walking around. Um, it seems like we're, 
the trend here is uh, relatively looking relatively stable over the past couple of months. So the big question is, how do I make this? Um, and the answer is using um, uh, is using co-location data. So Facebook um, through its data for good program. Sorry, I'm just going to jump out of here. So I think I've lost a slide. I put it in the wrong spot or something. I have lost a slide. No, oh, okay. Um, well, I'll just say this in words then. Um, so Facebook has um, uh, uh, provided a bunch of different uh, data products. So it comes from um, uh, users of the Facebook app who have location services installed, which is some small percentage of the number of Facebook users, and they leave it turned on all the time. And then you can basically track where people are going. So Facebook has um, aggregated that data uh, up and you know, not reported anything from regions where there are uh, small numbers of people. Um, and then for the most part, they've aggregated up to local government area, um, to sort of suburb area uh, scale, um, and uh, uh, reporting a few different things. Um, so, you know, the number of people who are in each location, um, mobility, um, so number of people moving between different, um, different regions um, in an eight hour period, I think, so you can get some uh, idea of mobility patterns, and something called a co-location probability. And I had to go and figure out what a co-location probability was um, from their data. And it turns out that it's this. So if you have, you know, they tell you the number of Facebook users who are in, let's say local, local government area A, so you know, ride uh, in North Sydney, say, um, total number of people that are in those uh, locations. And then they split the world up, um, otherwise into these, uh, what they call Bing tiles, it's a Microsoft product, I think, um, uh, that are like 600 meters by 600 meters. And then they look, count up the number of five minute windows uh, when people from each of these regions are co-located in each of these regions. So here's so at one time, let's say that um, you know, um, uh, this user from region I and this user from region J pass through this tile um, and you know, these other two users pass through this tile in the same five minute window. Uh, and no one goes through the third tile. Then it's next time, the next five minutes, um, uh, the same two people pass through the same tile again, maybe they've stayed there and have chat, um, and then um, and nothing else. And so then, you know, uh, in the next five minutes, um, these two people pass through these, um, through this same 600 meter by 600 meter square. And from that, they calculate a probability um, of any two users from regions I and J being co-located, right, being in the same square in a five minute window. So, you know, uh, this took me a little bit of time to figure out how they do this. Um, but that's just because I'm slow. Um, so essentially what it is, is you add up these numbers, right? So the number of co-locations that you've seen in these five minute, three five minute windows. Um, then you divide by the number of uh, uh, people who are in each uh, region, so four and five. And then 2016 is the number of five minute intervals in a week, right? So this becomes a probability of being co-located in a five for a five minute window, in a five minute window, um, averaged over the week. And that comes out to be a small number. So you can write down, um, you can write this down mathematically. And so essentially Facebook um, uh, reports to us at a weekly, um, uh, for each week, um, you know, you know, these three numbers. So the populations NI and NJ, for every local government um, area in the country, uh, for which, it's, which there's enough data, uh, and then these probabilities. And so, it's that. and so from that, you can uh, calculate an average number of contacts per person in a region uh, and, you know, for each state, say, so if, you know, NS is the population of people in the state, uh, you can calculate uh, the average number of contacts uh, in that state. Uh, and so from that, uh, what we go and do um, is, I've got this website here, uh, um, you know, I can, I can make these plots and show you this uh, social distancing. So there's maps and stuff on the website, which are cool to look at, which if I had more time, um, I'd go through, uh, but I want to finish on time. Um, uh, yeah, so instead I'll show you some of the uh, figures that Cameron made, uh, where you can see that uh, social distancing is waning uh, over time. So um, uh, the red uh, indicates uh, more social dis more waning of social distancing. So green is more of a propensity of people to stay at home 
uh, and in the outer suburbs, people are moving about more. Um, that is suggestive um, of uh, you know the, uh, the people in the outer uh, outer suburbs possibly um, people need to travel for work. Um, we're going back to uh, moving around more. Um, you know there are different areas, uh, size areas in all of these regions as well. Um, so there's some stuff that we need to uh, figure out or uh, calculate there a bit more, um, a bit more carefully. But there's some suggestion that uh, uh, people are moving about more in the outer suburbs than they are in the centre of each each city, which is interesting. Uh, and yeah, where we where we're going with this um, is to try and use these you know co-location probabilities right to say if there's an outbreak so you know this is um uh, this red uh, lga uh, is the local government area of uh, Brimbank um, in melbourne where the um uh, the cedar meats factory was um, and so you can start to do things like you know place some um uh, place an outbreak there um, and then use the co-location probability to see where else is at risk um of seeing um, uh, of, of seeing cases appearing. Um, so we're hoping that this might be used to uh, inform how testing, you know, the places where you might want to do uh, extra tests and things like this. And, you know, to the most part, you would expect that it's the uh, suburbs immediately around Brimbank that are most at risk, but there's some that are um, uh, more unusual. You know, it's not com completely just uh, uh, geospatially like a um, concentric ring. You know. So, um, yeah, what can I want to say about this? So the, I think the co-location uh, data is really interesting because um, it's one of the few uh, uh, data sets that's, being, that's out there being released by tech companies at the moment um, that provides information on contacts. You know, uh, Google and Apple provide um, uh, uh, mobility data. Um, so they show that people are, are moving about less, but that's not contacts. You know, it's not people coming into, um, uh, coming close to each other. That's just people are driving their cars less. Um, yeah, and so that's, you know, it's a unique data set for that reason. Um, so this all shows that social distancing is waning, um, but it's actually slower um, than I would have expected. Uh, and it's, it's slower than what was suggested if you look at um, uh, Google and Apple uh, data. And yeah, there's possibly some variation between uh, urban and regional areas. Um, yeah, and it, it maybe has application uh, to mapping geospatial risk. And so yeah, transmission is a, uh, is a network phenomenon. Now, what's the time? It's 20 past three. How long do I have, um, David? Do we end at half past or do we end at 25 past? Yeah, and you got five minutes maybe. Okay, maybe I'll take those five minutes and I'll, I'll go. I only wanted to say a few things about this Reddit stuff. Um, anyway, so I'll do that really quickly. Um, so this is mainly Curtis Murray's work. Um, his PhD is on uh, measuring uh, patient experience uh, in healthcare data. So he looks at um, uh, things that people post on patient uh, you know, hospital review forums and does web scraping on those and, and does natural language processing to try and uh, figure out what um, uh, a patient's experiences are with, uh, with healthcare. So um, coronavirus presented um, a really unique um, uh, opportunity where we could explore the, the arc of patient experience with coronavirus um, particularly through Reddit, because there's this um, nice Reddit forum uh, of people who post uh, their experiences, you know, day by day, in a lot of co a lot of cases with being diagnosed with um, uh, with coronavirus. So we collected um, a few thousand uh, posts uh, from this uh, subreddit. Um, by we, I mean Curtis um, collected them, um, and then looked at um, how many. Uh, it looked at uh, posts that were labelled with day one, day two, day three, day four, because that's how people tend to write uh, on these forums. So a lot of people write on day one uh, and then it drops off. But some people are writing things, still saying on day 60, here's how I feel after being diagnosed with coronavirus. So he ran something called network topic modelling, uh, which is a way of uh, uh, getting um, an idea of what are the words, the co-occurring words um, in a document. Um, you know, across an entire corpus. So if you treat each of these days um, as a document, um, what are the words which uh, identify each, uh, each day? And so you see that people talk about, you know, sore throat uh, and things uh, early on, on day one, and then that declines over time. Uh, you see the topic around uh, breathing and being on a ventilator and things like this peaks, um, you know, uh, come a week or two in. Uh, we even pick up, um, you know, completely unsupervised way, um, this asomia, um, loss of smell, loss of taste symptom. 
uh, very slightly. Uh, and you know, with this data, you can uh, do the sentiment analysis as well. So we uh, took another sentiment analysis dictionary and looked at words that were positive, labels being positive and negative, also being labeled as with various um, uh, different other emotions here. Uh, look, I mean, there's maybe some trends in here. There's maybe not, um, there's, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit early to tell. Um, yeah, it's interesting that there is a fear, um, a fear sentiment which seems to uh, uh, be prominent um, and then sort of decays maybe as time goes on. Um, yeah, I mean, we could correlate these, correlate these curves with the, uh, the topic curves um, and you find that there are topics that co-occur and um, that correlate well uh, with the positive emotions uh, and, uh, and topics which correlate well with the negative emotions over time. And so you can create a map. Um, uh, so we do a, um, something called multi-dimensional scaling on this distance matrix, like a PCA, um, uh, and find where these uh, clusters are. So there's a positive uh, cluster of positive words, a cluster of negative words. I think I zoom in a little bit here. And so you can see that some of the negative words are associated with those um, you know, pain and things like this, which makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, uh, the fear topic uh, is associated with people having um, high temperatures uh, early on. Um, and then, uh, yeah, in the, the positive, you know, people have uh, a positive towards doctors and have a lot of trust there. So, you know, a lot of that makes a lot of that makes sense. Um, but it's a perspective that you don't get from uh, other health, you know, from more traditional uh, data sets. So this is my last slide. Um, and you know, the first couple of points serve as a um, uh, as uh, some summary for the, for all across all these three uh, mini talks that I've given. Um, so, you know, social media data is at least unique. It gives you, it, it can give you information on stuff that you don't measure, you know, um, using traditional health data sources. Um, but, I mean, there's a huge caveat which all, with all of this, um, which is that every data set that I've talked to, talked about here is hugely, uh, has huge demographic biases. Um, and, you know, um, as always, um, we need to try and uh, understand those uh, biases. Um, and hopefully correct for them. Um, yeah, that's what we're trying to do with the Facebook data uh, now at the very least. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, with the, the last topic, um, I think there is some possibility. We've been uh, looking at um, uh, other forums on Reddit, you know, more general discussion forums on Reddit. And uh, it's been interesting to see that there are uh, sort of mental health-like topics and that are uh, emerging uh, without, any, without needing any supervision. Um, uh, so there might be some signal there um, in, in you know, looking at mental health consequences. So that's all I want to say. Um, if you want to ask questions, uh, then now's a great time. But otherwise, thank you very much. Um, yeah, this was fun. Yeah, <laughs> I heard somebody turned the microphone off to clap. That's lovely. <laughs> So if anyone wants to ask a question, you should be able to unmute yourselves now. Uh, anyone who'd like to unmute themselves and ask a question is very welcome to. There's someone clapping down the bottom as well. Nice. So Lewis, you, uh, you found there's this little sort of positive uh, fear bump in the sentiment analysis for the first couple of days. Maybe. And I mean, do, you, do you have any suspicion about what that corresponds to? So um, the association there was purely just through the correlation in these curves, right? So there was this, um, there were more theory type words and that curve correlated um, with some of these other, um, with some of these other topics. So we correlated with the topic, you know, the, um, uh, the topics that, the words that peaked around then for many of these um, temperature um, type words, so people you know, talking about they had a, a temperature of 101 degrees and things like this. Um, yeah, and so it was really um, around having um, a fever, having, you know, um, yeah, having high temperatures, um, uh, things like this, and being, yeah, you know, being worried that um, they, they might have coronavirus um, is what it seemed to be the most. Yeah, I should um, treat that um, fear bump uh, with a good degree of scepticism. It's not a huge amount um, of data that we have there. And, you know, as you would well know, 
Um, <laughs> your sentiment analysis stuff is fraught. <laughs> um, so, you know, I should do uh, uh, what our mentor, Peter Dodds, would tell us to do and look at the words next. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any more questions for anyone else? So I'm just going to ask something brief about this uh, sort of sentiment analysis and the topic modeling. Mm. So doing your topic modeling over the whole set of your whole corpus, mm -hmm. and then so you get you get your list of topics. Mm. And how you, and this is a bit of a technical question: How are you assigning sort of day by day which topics are more or less important? Just what's the measurement? Uh, 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 looking like at individual posts and looking at the topics in, within that post. Oh, okay. Um, uh, yes. So what? Um, so what Curtis did is he took every uh, uh, every post from every particular day. So there's multiple posts with day one, multiple posts yeah. with day two, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, and ran this topic modeling over them. And then essentially, um, uh, this form of topic modeling builds a network. Um, between words and documents, so a bipartite network. Um, and then it does community detection uh, on that bipartite, um, bipartite network. So it finds that there are groups of words uh, uh, that co-occur um, uh, with, uh, with, you know, across, across documents. So, you know, via documents or groups of words that co-occur. And so where you get the, the relative ranking out of that is that, um, there's a network model which has been fit there called a stochastic block model, um, which essentially assumes that this giant network, this word uh, document network, um, uh, can be described by a bunch of um, Erdős Renyi random graphs if you know about um, if you know about them. So where there's a certain connection probability um, in each of these regions. So it sort of um, does some Bayesian inference to figure out what those um, how many uh, networks there are that are all stuck together and what their connection probabilities are. So you can, um, uh, uh, yeah, those, those connection probabilities um, give you that ranking um, of, the, uh, of each topic. Um, yeah. Yeah, cool. <laughs> all right. Are there any more questions? I don't think I see anyone. So in that case, let's uh, thank Lewis once again for a very interesting talk. And I'm going to go out into the outside because it's a beautiful sunny day here <laughs> in Adelaide and enjoy the sunshine. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much.